afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us on uh, our what's going to be a very lively panel on Iran and all of the latest news regarding Iran. Um, with us, we have Mr. Michael Pregent, who is a senior fellow here at Hudson Institute. Um, we have Ali Reza Nader, who's the founder and chief executive officer of New Iran and a former associate, a uh, senior, sorry, <laughs> researcher with Rand Corps. Uh, we have Behnam Ben Taliblu, a senior fellow at the Foundation for Defense of Democracies, best known as FTD. And then finally, last but not least, we have uh, Nader Uskawi, who is a non-resident senior fellow at the Scowcroft Center for Strategy and Security at the Atlantic Council. But most importantly, he is an author, new author of the book, Temperature Rising, the Iran Revolutionary Guards and Wars in the Middle East, which should pretty much be a required reading for everyone right now because our whole panel is pretty much on the news of the IRGC being designated as a foreign terrorist organization. So we're going to start off with that and have our panelists uh, bring us up to date on what is the latest on all things Iran. We'll start with Mike Pregent. Okay, uh, so who are you? <laughs> oh, yeah, you're right. <laughs> well, we're so excited about our panelists. I'm just here kind of facilitating. I'm Suzanne Kianpour. Uh, I'm a political and uh, foreign affairs journalist. And uh, our C-SPAN's covering the event today, too, so thank you for being here. So what has happened the last week? Well, we had an FTO designation of the IRGC. We had the uh, lifting of oil waivers against uh, countries that import oil from the Islamic Republic of Iran. And we've had threats to close down the Straits of Hormuz. We've had rumors of defections at, uh, within the IRGC. We're still trying to confirm that. We've uh, been receiving reports that it's not true. But we do see a shakeup in IRGC leadership. And so a lot, is, a lot is happening. And all I would say is that before there was an FTO designation, a lot of uh, Americans who work in this space would say, well, you can't do that because they're not designated as a foreign terrorist organization. Now they are, and meaning the IRGC. And now the, the comments uh, from those that said there had to be an FTO designation before we could put more pressure on the You mean Islamic an American leadership? American leadership, American think tanks, American uh, people, and, and DOD specifically said we can't do, we can't target the IRGC because there's, they're not a foreign terrorist organization. Uh, we can't uh, add them to the AUMF because they're not a foreign terrorist organization. Those things have changed, and it's uh, it's a powerful tool uh, if if decision makers use it effectively. Uh, otherwise, it's just another designation. So I do agree with a lot of critics that say. The FTO designation uh, may not change anything. It, it won't change anything if we don't use it appropriately. And there's a difference. And all I'll say here is if the Islamic Republic, if the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps Navy shuts down the Straits of Hormuz, it's a legitimate military force. If the FTO designated Islamic Republic of Iran Navy shuts down the Straits of Hormuz, it's a much different story. Alariza? Well, I think the main effect is really psychological. I think as the Revolutionary Guards and the Islamic Republic overall <laughs> face a lot of pressure within Iran, um, this will increase not just financial or economic pressure on them, but psychological pressure as well. Um, you mean on the government or on or the, the people guards? Or both? No, on the guards, uh, for sure. The, the designation I'm talking about. And I think it will scare a lot of businesses uh, especially European companies from uh, working with any entity in Iran because you never know who you're dealing with because the guards have such a huge stake in the economy. They're the dominant force by far. And I think also it will make returning to the original JCPOA almost, I wouldn't say impossible, but very difficult um, because it puts so many impediments just beyond the nuclear issue on financial transactions with Iran um, that for years, if I think the Islamic Republic continues its policies, uh, especially support for terrorism, the terrorist designation will really kill any chance of it uh, being an economic powerhouse in Iran again. And I think ultimately that's what really matters to the guards, making money, and this is just terrible for business. Sure. So. 
first of all, thank you to Hudson for hosting this, I think, pretty timely and important event. Um, you know, there's a lot of Iranian Americans, a lot of Persians up on this stage, and in Persian culture, it's best to agree with those who invite you, but I want to slightly disagree here. Uh, I don't think it's just psychological, even though I think that is one of the major forces driving uh, the IRGC designation. There was a word, I think, used by Brian Hook or Secretary Pompeo in the initial press release, in the initial speech, where they, one week before the designation took effect, uh, they unveiled the move. And there was a word that was used, and that word is stigma. And I would underline this word if you're looking to understand the, the primary but not the only impact, stigma. This is the most stigmatic terrorist designation that exists in U.S. law that the U.S. can wield against a non-state actor. But this time, it's being used against an element of a state's formal military apparatus. So for the first time in history that this is happening, it is being done against Iran, the world's foremost state sponsor of terrorism. Now, I actually think this alone does not impede diplomacy with Iran. Iran has had the, the designation of state sponsor of terrorism since 1984. There's been multiple rounds of US-Iran diplomacy since 1984. I think if you call the spade a spade, this is a force multiplier for a good coercive diplomacy with Iran. This, is, this sinks the cost and says, Iran, if you do not fundamentally change, you are subject to this, this, this penalty, and here are the new penalties, which, by the way, the IRGC FTO designation does, if, if you want to get into legal implications, we can, broaden the base for uh, going after those who provide or receive material support from the Guard Corps, such as military training. And the military training one is so broad that that's why you saw a story two days ago in Reuters that tried to create this carve out for what the IRGC is doing in Iraq, because the US does liaise with a lot of entities that the IRGC also liaises with and receives support to or from in Iraq. So that's, this is a very, very, very stigmatic move. It casts a very, very broad net, and it sinks sufficient costs. So that's why it matters in a nutshell. And just to what Michael was saying about the shakeup of the IRGC at the top, you see Brigadier General Hussein Salami now being now the commander of the IRGC. He's promoted to Major General. Uh, in a ceremony. Why does this matter? When you look at most of the threats that Iran has been levying against the West, against Israel in the past five, six years, and I'll let Nader get into this because this is what his book touches on, but there's been a lot of rhetorical threats, and they've actually been pulling back because they understand they can't win a lot of the escalation spirals. So if the primary war is a war of words, who better than the most bloviating, rhetorically obfuscating guy Hussein Salami to now lead the Guard Corps. And you see a new normal locking into Iran's strategy as they attempt to wait out the Trump administration. Absorb the economic cost, status quo in the region, escalate a little bit vis-a-vis -vis Israel when you can, absorb the retaliation, and wait and see. And if the primary vector for the conflict is going to be rhetorical, then Hussein Salami is going to be leading the charge. He's much more violent, too. I thought uh, Salami was haram. <laughs> <laughs> it's it, it's, right. it's halal charcuterie. Regent has jokes. Sorry. Give me a yellow card me early. Yeah. I forgot so my yellow card. Sorry. <laughs> well, Dave, uh, thanks again uh, from uh, uh, Hudson Institute for uh, hosting us in this important panel. Um, the designation, FTO designation for IRGC was a huge step. From the Iranian point of view, it was the, uh, the uh, uh, straw that uh, broke camel's back. Iranians did not expect designation coming in on, on IRGC. Uh, uh, and when it came, and the, the speed of it, uh, it, the designation came, it caused a major upheaval within the IRGC organization. Uh, um, uh, Benham uh, um, uh, mentioned about the reshuffling of the uh, senior officers within the IRGC. Of course, we have Jafari, the head of the IRGC, the commander of the IRGC for the past uh, 13, uh, 11 and a half years. Uh, his term was supposed to end uh, in 2020. It's very unusual for a senior IRGC or senior uh, Artish commander uh, to leave the post before that, uh, uh, that uh, term is, is expired. Uh, he was let go because, because what it was, IRGC has been saying all along that if the US going to designate the, the organization as a terrorist organization, they are going to uh, make the life miserable for the, uh, for the U.S. personnel in the, in the Middle East, for our installation, for our allies uh, in the Middle East. Uh, they're going even to close the Strait of Hormuz uh, if it need be. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, designation came, and uh, nothing really could have happened, and nothing did happen. So they had to change, they had to change from top down because they have lost credibility. 
the day before uh, uh, Jaf uh, Jafari was sacked, he himself uh, fired uh, General Nasiri, uh, who was the uh, head of the internal security for IRGC. Uh, very unceremoniously, unceremonia they just announced that Jafari had, uh, had uh, uh, chosen a new uh, director for internal security for IRGC. And those two events came day back to back and shows the amount of uh, issues they were, uh, they were uh, facing. Nasiri is the one, by the way, that was uh, uh, rumors, uh, but I'm not sure it is true, that uh, he might have defected to one of the uh, US embassies in, in, uh, in, in the Gulf. Um, true or not, that shows that his firing the day before changing the top uh, IRGC commander is a show of instability, is a show of confusion, and all the problems that IRGC had with the FTO designation is going to be multiplied. And I agree with uh, Michael that now uh, uh, Central uh, uh, Command, the uh, US uh, uh, Central uh, uh, Command Forces, uh, the uh, commanders on the ground, on the sea, uh, have uh, more authority uh, to deal with provocations that coming from IRGC Navy and IRGC uh, uh, personnel and the Shia militias that are under the control of the Quds Force, the extraterritorial branch of the IRGC. Now, another thing, if I could just add very quickly, it's interesting that it's just the Revolutionary Guards, it's not the regular military, the Artash. So I think it'd be interesting to see how this potentially affects the relationship between the two as well. What is the relationship between the two like? It's competitive because Artesh doesn't get a lot of funding. Uh, there are a lot of reports. Artesh is army. Yep, mm -hmm. regular military from the Shah's time. Uh, but uh, its soldiers are very poorly paid. A lot of them are homeless even, uh, don't have enough to eat. Whereas the Revolutionary Guards is much better funded. And traditionally, the US, since the revolution, I, want, I don't want to say it has be had better relations with Artesh. But I know for the US Navy, uh, when I did a lot of work for the US Navy, I know that the Navy considered the Arctic to be more professional, whereas the Revolutionary Guards were the terrorists. They're the reckless, very violent guys. And if you look at the new head of the Revolutionary Guards, uh, he's a much more thuggish figure, uh, relatively uneducated, very devoted to the revolution, and very violent. So I think. His uh, promotion is not only because of what's happening outside of Iran, but the regime's deep worry about another revolution or revolt. If they want somebody to quell any future uprisings, this is the guy to do it. Just one, one quick, quick thing, on, and then I'll go to you. I'm sorry, I'll throw it to you. <coughs> I mean, the IRGC, so the regular army answers to the Supreme Leader, but they all fall under the Ministry of Defense. The IRGC answers directly to the Supreme Leader. So there's, there's not an attack necessarily on the on the Iranian people or the regular military. It's against the equivalent of what the SS was to the regular German army, you know, the IRGC versus the Iranian regular army. And we should promote competition, uh, or we should hope to find comp competition between the two and schisms to exploit. And this shakeup at the top, I think, is an opportunity for the US and others yes. to. Yeah, th three great points on that. One is, of course, that there's a famous Khomeini quote, which you know I've lost in Persian, but now exists in a lot of the English language histories of the revolution, which is when you're talking about the founding of the IRGC, he says, the Artesh has the Shah in its blood. Think about the impact of that statement. The Artesh, when you look at their military capabilities today, they're a grade A 1962 American trained third world military. You know, exactly what the kind of military assistance programs we gave to other kind of countries that fell into this basket during the Cold War. And they remain as such. You look at their conventional capabilities, the F-4, the F-14, some of the frigates that they operate in the Persian Gulf still. So that, that's the first thing, the need to protect not the territorial integrity of Iran, but the revolution, which is it's the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps, not the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps. They are defending by nature something extraterritorial. The second is to what Ali Reza was just saying, which is a great point about Salami's background. His background, thuggish, is a great way to put it, because when you think about the origins, the evolution of the IRGC, the IRGC evolved out of the small kind of mini militias, the comites that they were called in Tehran after the revolution, uh, that were armed, that were kind of thuggish and brig brigandy. And, and Salami's background and his statements and his very kind of shoot from the hip, hopefully not literally, um, style 
it fits consistently with that, with that uh, metaphor. And then the third point about Michael is that if you look to do kind of Western mirror imaging, the, the traditional STEM charts of military authority and military command, you're going to fundamentally miss the point of the IRGC, which is that by the military structure, the Quds force is under the IRGC. But there's no way that Soleimani was subordinate to Jafari, even though his STEM chart would say he was subordinate to Jafari. When you say thuggish, can you explain, give a little bit of background for those who might not kind of understand what the IRGC historically is, especially for those who are joining on C-SPAN? Well, I'll tell you from my earliest memory, that's one of the things I remember, that in Iran, after the revolution, they formed these committees, comites, and they're supposed to basically man uh, specific neighborhoods and enforce fundamentalism, a uh, Khomeini's fundamentalist view of what Iran should be like. And that's where these forces grew from. Uh, people Khomeini recruited and trained to make sure that the intelligentsia, the royalists, the artesh, the security forces wouldn't challenge them, that, um, that these typically religious fundamentalist street people uh, would form a vanguard to protect the regime. And over time, they, they've just grown tremendously from um, their command of Iran's military to being the premier security force, the most trusted intelligence force. They have their own wing of Evin prison. Uh, they're the biggest business actor in Iran, by far, uh, dominate the, all the industry. So there's no way that when somebody says this empowers the guards, or creates unity, that's true in Iran. It weakens them, because this is a business. This is mafia-like business that we've seen in other countries, for example, post-Soviet uh, Russia. And this is the worst news I think they could have uh, gotten. And there's zero indication that Iranians have rallied around the flag. Uh, exactly the opposite. A number of Iranians, prominent Iranians, activists from inside Iran, have praised the designation of the guards as a terrorist organization. Because for most Iranians who've experienced the guards, who've experienced these committees, who've uh, been harassed, sent to jail, tortured, uh, sometimes for a few strands of hair being out, this is a terrorist organization. Uh, the uh, uh, new crop of general officers and senior officers in IRGC and the Gots Force uh, are different from the older, older generation who uh, the, 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 uh, seems to me on the military side of it, on the, on the economic and mafia side, yes, you, uh, you, you are absolutely right. On the military side, these are the guys who really do not have that much of experience in Iraq-Iraq war, which dominates the uh, military doctrine of, of, of the older Iranian uh, uh, military officers. Uh, these are the officers who have, be, uh, for the past 40 years, have been re uh, uh, rising in, in the ranks by uh, um, competing uh, 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 against each other, who would be more anti-US, anti-West, anti-Israel, who would say this kind of a deal. So this is the kind of a culture they have, they have brought up. And I'm not surprised that one of them, Salami, uh, uh, now is, being, uh, is going to uh, given the uh, authority over the whole IRGC. Uh, he represents, in that sense, a lot of the new crop of the, of the IRGC officers coming to power who are much more radical, much more anti-Israel, anti, uh, openly, openly they say, Salami says so, and openly they, uh, uh, at the kernel level, you can, you can see a lot of them uh, calling, to this day, uh, uh, calling for the uh, uh, wiping of Israel off the map, and uh, uh, very much anti-US. Um, also, a cautionary note on Artesh, the regular army. Uh, in the past 40 years, uh, the uh, 40 years has been passed from the time of the revolution. So a lot of officers who are coming to the ranks, to the senior ranks within the Artesh, uh, have been um, uh, uh, gone through this uh, indoctrination, if you will, the ideology of the Islamic Republic. So a general officers today who wears Artesh uniform versus the IRGC, who wears uh, an IRGC uniform general officers, they pretty much look the same, uh, not uniform-wise, but from their point of view, from the world view. Uh, they are as, as radical, uh, they the really new artist guys, it? as radical. I don't think they really believe in it. Um, I don't know. They, it might be argued, and, and, and rightly so. What makes you that think psychologically, they really believe in it? This is a fail the system is a failure. They're, 
they can't get by, they can't defeat their families. Iran is completely isolated. The revolution has totally failed. Everybody in Iran knows the revolution has failed. Who do you think they blame for that, though? Their leadership. Across the board? Not across the board, but majority. But no, no, no doubt. I think they're seething. But if that's true, that's board. true across the board, not just Artesh. No, I mean, there's other uh, always, I think. There is cultural committed. differences between Artesh and IRGC, of course. And, then, and the organization culture does affect how you behave. I agree with that. But I'm um, saying that on just cautionary notes, that the new generation of the Artesh leadership are as revolutionary, quote unquote, and as radical as uh, their on brothers. Paper, and, uh, I, I would agree on paper, is, but is not reality. very much reality. alive. I mean, if you're in, you're in. And the vector is pretty done. And you think so? Oh, yeah, yeah. The, the the Have you been speaking to people inside the country? Absolutely, that you, yeah. And including places outside of the big cities? Up because in especially the southern in part the of the country, that's not necessarily Especially there. if you go out to the, the major centers of the uprising last year were in the small cities. Those were economic. No, they weren't. Absolutely not. They were ripping up Khamenei's picture. That's, that's not true. Economic. That did happen. That happened which everywhere. Was, which was a game changer. Look, if the flooded way. areas, if you go to Khuzestan and Loristan, the guards have admitted they can't go into villages because they get stoned and attack their videos of them. That's why they send the Hashtal Shabi and Hezbollah to those areas. Because people in those areas will not tolerate the guards anymore. There are areas, there are specific villages that are outside of their control they won't even go into. We are getting close to my next question, little, but Ben wants a, to say a, something. A riff in between two positions because I'm between two competing, <laughs> two, two competing be, camps here. You because can bring there's them together. A, yeah, or, or, you know, a resident diplomat. There's the heroic flexibility of Khamenei I could you know, choose to exude, or those who know your Islamic theology. This is Manzil Bain and Manzil Atain, the position between two positions. <laughs> so don't, don't take that politically. <laughs> <laughs> um, listen, to, to Nader's point, to, to Nader Oskoi's point, the, yes, there's an organizational culture, which is the inheritor of that military assistance that the U.S. had given it that helped shape Iran's national army. But because of the impact of the revolution, there is a Siyasi office, a political indoctrination office, which is supposed to take the values of the revolution, whatever crop is left of it, and try to transpose it onto it. And I think to Nader's point, with, this, with, the right, with the changing of the generation across the field in the IRGC and the Artesh, this indoctrination is going to have a harder time imposing itself on the bureaucratic culture, given that A, the bureaucratic culture in this one is slightly more Western, and B, there's generational changes in both. And just for those of you who know me in the audience, it was Nader who said the Iran-Iraq war first, not me. But now he, that he said it, mm -hmm. I'm going to say something about it, because this new crop of people who are active and who are spreading Iran's revolution abroad now, their, their narrative is the Iran-Iraq war, but it's also the strategic competition with America since the war. It's how Iran rebuilt itself. It's, it's investment in missiles, investment in fast boats. The, the war is the primary medium for them, but now the way they bled America during Iraq. And this is their blueprint for confrontation with America. And that's why I said, now Salami's coming in. He's going to be fighting the war of words, because he's now saying, OK, there's a 2020 bar on the Trump administration. It seems like there's a lot of rhetoric. We're going to escalate the rhetoric and keep everything else as we have been, because it's been working for them. So I think a lot of people kind of have a question of all of these recent policy chain moves, rather, from the White House, whether it's designating the IRGC as a foreign terrorist organization or it's not uh, renewing waivers and really kind of clamping down on Iran's oil exports. Um, what does the end game look like? What's the goal? What, what, what is the White House trying to achieve? Well, so. There's, there's two clocks, and we all know that. There's a clock in the Middle East, and there's the clock in the West. Uh, the Middle East, Iran particular, particularly, is being told to wait out the Trump administration, wait out the next 20 months. And it goes to your point, where, where Salami will have this rhetoric that is very um, you know, boisterous and, and makes threats, yet they probably won't do anything. They, they will have to rely on Arab militias to attack Americans. And I think one of, the, one of the best things that came out of this morning was Akram al-Kabi. He's a designated terrorist in Iraq. He's an IRGC Quds Force proxy leader of the terrorist organization Harakat al-Nujaba. He said, hey, listen, <laughs> we don't work for Iran. We're against the, the sanctions uh, on Iran, but we will not attack Americans on behalf of Iran. And that's huge. 
because that's an Arab militia leader who's been designated as a terrorist for being part of the IRGC Quds Force proxy network that has preemptively told Qasem Soleimani, no, I will not attack Americans. So we're waiting for Case Kazali to say that also. We're waiting for uh, Abu Mehdi al-Mohendis to say that also. Because at the end of the day, there are five key Arab militias that can attack Americans based on the rhetoric coming from Salome. And it's the Iraqi militias, it's Lebanese Hezbollah, it's, it's uh, other groups, the Taliban. We've seen that there's lethal aid to the Taliban. The same day as the FTO designation, four Americans were killed by the Taliban. I'm not trying to say that it's a conspiracy theory, but we know that Iran's provided lethal aid to the Taliban, and the same day uh, the RGC was designated as a foreign, or was, the information came out that we were going to designate uh, the RGC uh, and its Quds Force as a foreign terrorist organization. Four Americans died uh, by a Taliban IED, and we know the RGC provides lethal aid. So what's the end game? It's not just a message to Iran. It's a message to everybody. We also saw the $10 million uh, awards that, that fall on Lebanese actors uh, in the information uh, proving a, a financial tie to the IRGC or a tie to Iran to launder money uh, is, is now in play. This is a warning to, to Iraqis. This is a warning to the Iraqi government. This is a warning to the, to the Iraqi military. Uh, when you talk to National Security uh, Council officials in the White House, they say they're not going to ha- answer questions on hypotheticals. Well, the, the IRGC touches Bada Corps every day. It touches AAH every day. It touches Kitab Hezbollah every day. It touches all of these Iraqi militias every day. And this is now a message not only to Iran that, that we can limit your oil production, but also to its neighbors that you need to start distancing yourself from a failing economy because if the 20-month clock runs out and there's a new administration, I, I, I agree with, with Benham from a conversation we had a week ago, that the, this gives a Democrat president new leverage in renegotiating the JCPOA. You now have more leverage than you ever had before. And uh, it also you know, allows this administration to continue to ramp up the pressure for 20 months. So we talk. I say they, the regime can't survive another, or can survive another 20 months. They can wait out the Trump administration, but can they wait out another five years of a consistent maximum pressure campaign? So the goal is to get them back to the negoci- negotiating table. The negotiating table and no incentives before concrete steps, no, uh, no waivers. I mean, if you look at the JCPOA, Iran was failing before we walked away from the Iran deal last year. Uh, they squandered the economic benefits. They accelerated their uh, support to proxy networks. They c- created new militias. They increased their ballistic missile testing. They were doing all of that under the protections of the JCPOA. So this strengthens a Republican administration or a Democrat administration to deal with the Islamic Republic over the next 20 months or five years, six years, uh, if we do it right. And this is a way to, to do it right because every red line that we were told not to cross, we've crossed and it hasn't come with a response. And that's why Jaffer is not there anymore because... Right. Uh, continuing on, on Michael's point about uh, messaging the uh, uh, Shia militias in Iraq, uh, that messaging is also toward, directly toward Iran, too. Uh, uh, for the first time in many years, we're going to have two uh, strike carrier groups in uh, Arabian Sea and the Persian Gulf at the same time. And uh, uh, those of you who know any uh, those strike carrier groups, these are huge uh, armaments, uh, uh, Armada, uh, they, they bring in into, into the four. And... and uh, I'm old enough not to uh, accept coincidences. Things do not happen by coincidence. If there are two carrier, uh, 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 strike carrier groups are, are uh, approaching uh, Arabian uh, uh, Sea and the Persian Gulf, is a message to Iran about the closure of the Strait of Hormuz uh, that, uh, that be careful. It's not just a messaging to the Shia militias, but also directly to the Iranian armed forces uh, that we're going to have enough forces and we're going to be ready. Um, by the way, I do not see uh, uh, how they could close uh, a Strait of Hormuz or how they could even come uh, doing, uh, they can close it for a few days, but keeping, keeping a Strait of Hormuz closed is going to be extremely costly and probably going to the beginning of the end of the Iranian regime. Uh, 
Uh, on the White House, just one, uh, one um, uh, quick uh, uh, point. Uh, those of us who were born in Iran and raised in Iran, we had to read uh, the tea leaves uh, to see what the uh, government uh, meant to say. Um, so that we do have that kind of a capability to read the White House through the tea leaves. Seems to me that uh, I agree that for the next two years is the maximum pressure for the next year and a half, for the maximum pressure uh, to the point that Iranian will come to the table uh, from President Trump's point of view, come to the table to renegotiate uh, a JCPOA 2, which would include regional activities and would include, uh, would include uh, 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 ballistic missiles and would eliminate uh, 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 sunset uh, uh, clauses in the, in the nuclear pro program. But also, there is a thinking about that if the uh, re-election, uh, the president gets re-elected, then they, if, this, if this pressure will continue, uh, we're going to, uh, and, and, and uh, oil gets to uh, approximate zero, we're going we're gonna to expect, uh, I would expect, a collapse in the I Iranian economy. The Iranian economy was on the verge of collapse before, uh, before President Trump walked out of JC4. Now, with the oil going net zero, and with unfortunate things about these uh, recent floods across the country, the economy is in a worse kind of a shape. And, and I agree with, uh, 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 with uh, Ali Reza that uh, with this kind of economic, economic situation we have, we're going to see, uh, definitely we're going to see waves after waves of demonstrations after this uh, uh, flood uh, emergency ends. Uh, we're going to see a wave of new wave of demonstrations. If you look uh, at the numbers, if you look at the numbers, the government in Iran, Rouhani's government, forty percent of its budget, so it says, comes from oil revenues. It could be much higher. By May tenth, when the oil waivers uh, are negated, whatever you, the terminology is, when uh, all these countries stop buying Iranian oil, and they will, uh, even China, I think. There's a good chance it will buy, uh, stop buying Iranian oil. Um, by that time, 4.6 million people on the government's payroll will not be paid. And if you think that each person supports a family of three or four, that's about 18 to 20 million people. So just the numbers alone are traumatic for the Islamic Republic. And when you couple that with deep internal resentment, women refusing to abide by the regime's laws, uh, demonstrations everywhere all the time. If you make an argument that this regime is going to survive that, uh, you better have very good evidence as to how. Now, what is the US administration's goal? I think officially is to engage in um, negotiations and reach another agreement. I don't know if that's possible in 20 months. I think I'm beginning to suspect the time for negotiating any sort of agreement is just done and over with, uh, especially if there's a campaign of maximum pressure like this. I think the key question is, well, uh, Tehran uh, experienced massive unrest, and I think it will in the future. I think Iranians are very afraid to come into the street because they don't know what the alternative is. Uh, but when you have nothing, when you have nothing to eat, uh, when the regime steals everything from you, when you get desperate, people do desperate things. Uh, so I don't think Iran is going to be stable in the next 20 months whatsoever. It's not now. If, if you look at Khuzestan, Loristan, a lot of the smaller towns that you mentioned, uh, they're very, very anti-regime. They want the regime gone. As, and that's uh, where those oil jobs are. are. All the oil is in Khuzestan. What the regime has done is actually it diverted the flood so it would not touch the oil fields, and it has flooded hundreds of thousands of people's farmlands. When you have that situation, of course you have to bring the hash to shabby. People are not going to accept your authority when you're driving them into the ground. Who are the hash uh, to The Iraqi Shia militias and Hezbollah that have been brought uh, by, Ura by Khamenei to occupy southwest Iran, foreign forces all on Iranian, non-Iranian. Ben has the floor. So let's, let's work forward, because there's so much here to unpack. On the two carrier strike groups entering the Persian Gulf, significant, but also significant because it's a course correction, right? I think the Trump administration is also seeing a course correction in its Iran strategy. And if there is a date tied to all this US policy that you're saying, Suzanne, it's May 8th. And that's not just my birthday, that's the anniversary of, <laughs> that's the, anniversary of the walkout of the JCPOA. Yeah. And so 
all this pressure building up to May 8th needs to kind of be now marshaled by the administration, needs to be touted, say, these are the successes of max pressure, and then they need to follow on with a domestic Iranian component, which is if they care about what's going on in the street, come up with something like a max care. You know, this is, these are the successes of max care. So as you move into beyond one year of the JCPOA walkout, they're going to have to have something to show for it. And I think the FTO designation, beginning to go after Arab and non-Arab Shia militias, there was a time, I think, for about six to eight months, I don't know how long, if someone wants to correct me, there were zero carriers in the Persian Gulf under Donald Trump. That's a big problem, especially when you have the drop-off of fast attack crafts harassing carriers, but the increase of drones harassing fast attack craft, uh, fast harassing U.S. carriers and U.S. ships and U.S. vessels. So Iran's footprint in all these theories of conflict is evolving so that it can continue to compete with you, so that it can continue to contest you, but do so without inviting that overwhelming response. That's why drones feature so much in Iran's serious strategy vis-a-vis -vis Syria and Israel, because it's finding new and innovative ways to continue to compete and make sure that you don't use the one major tool you have at your disposal to crush that competition. So this is the evolving Iranian way of war, the evolving Iranian footprint here. And on to, I think, some of Ali Reza's points. I'm remiss to say this publicly, but I might as well say this. There was a friend who was talking to her family in Tehran, and her family is originally not from Tehran. They moved to Tehran. And she was talking to me about the flooding. And <laughs> I'll say it first in Persian, because it, it, for those of you who speak Farsi, it cuts very deep, and it's about the flooding. And they said, Akash sail Tehran Rami board. Like, yeah, oh, I, that, so. oh, oh, I wish like the floods would take Tehran. Because like the December 2017 protests, these protests are outside in. And when you have like all, all like the, the people who the revolution was supposed to be for protesting against the revolution, and then those with genes cooler than you and I kind of on the sidelines and the rich kids of Tehran, Instagram, and like the regime money in places like North Tehran, that, that doesn't feel good, especially if you're an ethnic or religious minority or just someone who actually is faithful. The, you know, the, one of the more interesting signs now about the revolution, about, about the protests since December 2017 to present, which could be called proto-revolutionary, is that you see women in Shadors supporting women taking off their Shadors, or you see women in Shadors holding pictures of the son of the Shah, whereas in 1979, it was, the, it was the exact opposite social phenomenon. So these are just really interesting things to watch, watch as we go into beyond one year of max pressure. I heard the same thing about Tehran, but somebody told me I wish there was flooding in Tehran so people would rise up and overthrow the Islamic Republic. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, but that's how bad it's become. Yeah. This is how people think in Iran. That you know, I've, I've t People told me in Iran, I wish anything happens, anything happens, so we get rid of the clerics. So, these are well-off people, too, by the way. They're not just poor villagers. So on that note, then what next? And what is the U.S., what is, where is the U.S.'s role in that? Is there even a desire for a U.S.'s role in that, in the what next? Let me just add to the, the tool is very powerful if used, the FTO designation, the Foreign Terrorist Organization. And I love the language of what material support is. So Americans providing material support to include advice, to include talking points to groups that are trying to lobby the United States to change the FTO designation. The tool is broad. It's whether or not you have the political will to use it. And we only talk about Department of State equities when it comes to the FTO designation. If you look at what the Department of State can do, it can actually go after members, family members of the regime that are here, that are tied to the IRGC in a way that you couldn't do it before. And how do we know this? Because when we talked about doing this before, everybody on the other side of the argument would say, well, you can't do that. There's no FTO designation. Well there, well, there is now. So it changes things. But again, if you don't use this powerful tool, then you, you can't affect the change you need over the next 20 months. But I, I, I think that every month, we're going to see something new. Every month, we're going to see something US? new from the US over the next 19 like months additional members being uh, sanctioned, additional entities, industries, industry, CBI, uh, IRB, you know, the IRIB, yeah. IRIB uh, different entities, because that's what's being asked now. So the ask now to the US government, go after the regime's family members, out, out the regime's uh, hidden finances, go after lobbies, go after lobbies, go after these different groups, and change the authorization for use of military force. So you can, I think our, the AUMF is, is racist. We, we have no problem attacking Sunni terrorists, but we won't attack Shia terrorists. Uh, I, I say that because somehow, if you're a designated Shia 
terrorist group, the U.S. military won't hit you. But we have, we have hit IRGC Quds Force proxies. We've hit them in Al Tanaf. We've hit them in Abu Kamal. And the organizations that we hit are Harakat al Nujeba, our Kitab Imam Ali, our Kitab um, Hezbollah. So three Iraqi militias tied directly to Qasem Soleimani have been hit by U.S. airstrikes in Syria. The AUMF is in place. If they demonstrate an offensive capability that threatens the U.S. presence or the U.S. mission in Syria, they have been hit. And what I like about this designation, it, again, I'll go back to what Akram al kabi said. No, you're not going to use us to attack Americans in Iraq. And that's a big deal, because you have a designated terrorist whose militia has been hit in Syria by U.S. airstrikes telling the Americans, we are not going to attack you, even if Qasem Soleimani asks us to. And that's a big deal. So of course, the, the attack on the uh, Shia militias in Syria started uh, by Israel uh, in, the past, in the past couple of years. And I think Israelis showed in actions they took against the militias in Syria that you can hit uh, the Shia militias uh, installations. You can hit the command and control centers of the Quds Force in Syria. You can hit their uh, arms depot in Syria. Uh, you can dismantle. Uh, the UAV and, uh, and ballistic missile bases in Syria, and, uh, and the Quds Force could not, and the RGC could not do anything about it, uh, did not even attempt uh, uh, to uh, uh, take retaliatory actions against Israel. Um, of course, then we have the U.S. Uh, bombing also of those, of those militias. That will give a very uh, strong signal, not only to militias working in Syria, but also for the, for the Quds Force-led uh, uh, Shia militias inside Iraq uh, in, uh, uh, or, or, or places outside Syria and Iraq, in places like uh, Yemen, uh, that, uh, that they mean uh, that uh, uh, U U.S. can hit this without that uh, notion that if we hit this, uh, the, whole, the whole world will go up the flame. Uh, Syria showed that the Iranians not, are not ready, are, are, are not capable. Of, uh, of launching uh, effective counter, uh, counter effect. Yes, they can, they can beat a Sunni extremist uh, uh, in Syria, but that's totally different than going head to head with superior military forces like Israel and the US. In terms of US policy, if I can just add before I forget, you know, for the US, it has to really think ahead of what comes after the Islamic Republic. And I think you can't predict what comes after. But some of the forces shaping Iran, I think, are what the U.S. should pay attention to. Secularism, total rejection of religious rule. I believe the vast majority of Iranians don't want religious rule. Patriotism, meaning caring for Iran and its national interests and not the interests of Khamenei and his uh, clique. And I think patriotism. And, and nationalism. I like to call it patriotism. But it's one of the few places in the world where nationalism That's what has, I mean. has a positive force. Whereas in Poland, Hungary, perhaps even the United States, if I may say so, sorry to interrupt, uh, it actually is pejorative. This is the one place. That's why I call it patriotism. It's still nationalism. <laughs> well, that's, uh, but, that's and why also, kind of the move on the IRGC <laughs> was a pretty, I mean, you know, it, it, it was an interesting move because there, the IRGC historically, as you mentioned, did have this kind of glorious sort of reputation for bringing Iran to victory during the Iran Iraq War. Actually, it doesn't. If, if, if yeah, what, read the what, Rand, my Rand pop, uh, I wrote a study on Rand, actually, and a lot of Iran for Rand years ago, and what we found out, a lot of Iranians actually believed that the guards prolonged the war, including Mohsen Rezai, the then commander of the war. I think that's a myth that guards would like people to believe. The same myth as a defeated ISIS. It played a role, but it tries to burnish its nationalist credentials, whereas I don't think Iranians buy it because it, it's an exploitative mafia. It's not anything patriotic or nationalist, whatever you want to call it. Um, I, when, when Iranians look at this uh, system, they compare it to what Iran was like. If you look at Iran in the 70s and of the Shah's time, on ev what, what, whatever you think of the Shah personally, on every level, economic, social, social freedom, international respect, Iran was one of the top countries in the Middle East. On every ranking, it's one of the uh, countries really at the bottom. And so there's how, why would Iranians take pride in a force that exploits them, floods their lands, 
Uh, no, they're going to stone the guards' officers when they come to their villages. I don't think the guards is a nationalist. When I say nationalist or patriotism, it's caring for the country of Iran. The Islamic Republic doesn't care for Iran. It just wants to exploit it. And I think Iranians know this very well. And I think they're getting to the point where they're willing to act uh, and defend their rights. Are there emerging alternatives? Well, I think once is Islamic... Not, not outside yeah, one, the When you have a totalitarian country that controls politics, of course they're not going to allow alternatives to come out. But I think what's interesting in Iran, once the Islamic Republic gets weaker, once the security forces get weaker, you're going to see these alternatives emerge. You know, I, I was talking about patriotism or nationalism. I think there is a definite rise in that. There's a definite rise uh, in terms of appreciation for the Pahlavi monarchy. Um, I think Manitou TV has done a great job in burnishing that. The entire culture has changed, but I think what we get to hear in D.C. is the well-off pro-reformists uh, coming to D.C. and telling us what everybody else thinks, whereas 90% of the population there at least doesn't think like that anymore, if it ever did. I mean, with Foreign Minister Zarif currently in New York. I mean, he spins things. He's built a network. He has analysts who repeat his uh, talking points verbatim. If Zarif is our interlocutor, we're not going to get anywhere. It has to be, the scope has to be broadened out to talk to other people. Uh, and I think the administration has done a really good job of uh, meeting with dissidents, opposition or social activist leaders, whether it's Massey, Ali, Najat, or Reza, Pahlavi, whoever. Uh, it doesn't matter who it is. We're not picking one person. I think what's important is don't listen to what Jess Zarif says. Don't trust what Jess Zarif has. This guy has an agenda, and he's done a very good job in implementing his agenda. But he needs to be challenged, and people like him need to be challenged, because these realities that, the, you know, these things we were told that the guards are patriotic, that uh, people blame Trump, they're not true. I and mean, this is a country seething with frustration and anger at the regime. Why do we keep blaming it on the United States? It's really, to me personally, it's a very frustrating issue because it does not meet criteria of objective fact. But going back to your, uh, going back to IRGC, mm -hmm. uh, uh, your point, I think, is very well taken, uh, that it was a myth uh, of, at least for the extraterritorial branch of the IRGC, for the Quds Force, for Soleimani, uh, that they were invincible. They were, they were doing whatever they want to do in the Middle East. That myth, uh, uh, were broken on two different, uh, by two different uh, campaign against, direct, uh, directly against the IRGC uh, outside the country. One was the Israeli campaign uh, in Syria, and the other one was the uh, UAE uh, uh, Saudi uh, campaign against, uh, uh, against the, uh, uh, the IRGC in, in Yemen. Um, I remember days that, uh, that uh, uh, Mahan Air had a daily flight um, actually, 14 flights a week uh, between Tehran and Sana. They were not carrying tourists. They were carrying uh, um, the arms uh, to the Houthis. Uh, with that blockade they did, the uh, uh, Saudis and the Emiratis, uh, they, uh, and, and uh, GCC in general, uh, they stopped that. So that was, that was the first beginning of telling Soleimani that uh, you cannot do whatever you want to do. We're going to stop you. And then the Israeli... Uh, with their uh, major uh, and continue and continuing uh, uh, air strikes on, on Iranian facilities, cemented that and destroyed that myth, and uh, and now the IRGC is saying that hey we can we can, we can close the Strait of Hormuz if you if you uh, designate us as FTO. Guess what? They did designate you, and you cannot do anything. Just real quick on on victories that Iran has had. So we talked about not right. having a victory right. in the Iran Iraq War. Uh, we, a lot of us argue, when we did the uh, Department of the Army study of the Iraq War, we came out with the consensus that Iran was the victor in Iran, in Iraq, correction. So we have seen victory, victories by the IRGC in, in Iraq, in Syria, in Lebanon, and in Yemen. But because of the sanctions, because of walking away from the Iran deal, because of these, these new oil waivers, we're now seeing Iran have less influence in Iraq, but need it more than ever. So there's this, this interesting balance. You, you have influence, you're, you're losing influence in Iraq, but now you need Iraq more than ever because you're trying to use Iraq's economy to offset U.S. sanctions. In Syria, they've stopped their oil payments to Syria, to Assad. Uh, Lebanese Hezbollah is complaining that they're not receiving enough funds from Iran. So the, these things are working. Now you have Iraqi militias trying to distance themselves from the IRGC. They have a $1.2 billion 
budget just for salaries, the IRGC could force militias in Iraq. Qasem Soleimani is going to try to get some of that. And when Qasem Soleimani gives you $100 million, he expects $50 million back in the same transaction. So there are places where Iran has won, the IRGC has won, but now they're losing territory because of the sanctions. The sanctions are working because they no longer have the protections of the U.S. being in the JCPOA and because of these new uh, oil waivers expiring. So I just wanted to get that in when we talk about wins and losses. Sure. So if you're going to use the, the past to kind of learn about the future, going past May 8th, going past the one-year anniversary of the walkout, what's next, right? You know, where, where should the administration improve, right? So it's the steady drumbeat, the designations, the FTO, the economic side. Those are the successes the administration largely was forecasted to have. But what we've been talking about mostly here, the Persian Gulf, the region inside Iran, Syria, this is the, the regional theater. And that's even though we are preventing some arms from going in there, even though Iran is now contested uh, in Iraq, even though Yemen is now a contested space, um, in the heartland, which is Iraq and Syria and Lebanon, places where Iran's land bridge is slated to go through, U.S. policy really does need to be stepped up there. And you know, you look at the October 13, 2017 speech. That's actually the speech in that speech by President Trump where he first designated the IRGC as a terrorist group under Treasury Department authorities. And in that same speech, he decertified the JCPOA nuclear deal. But it, you know, that same day, the White House got out a fact sheet when it's much awaited Iran policy, because remember, they were waiting for an Iran six-month interagency policy review to put out what the policy would be. And the policy was, be, was going to be, don't focus on nuclear only, and now incorporate the regional stuff. That is still missing. And that is still what needs to be improved after May 8th. So there's been a lot of economic success. No one is going to doubt our capability and our will on the sanctions front. I mean, maybe I do have one doubt on the Asian hydrocarbon economies after May 2nd. How are we going to enforce the oil sanctions after May 2nd vis-a-vis -vis China and vis-a-vis -vis India? Especially if China going into May 2nd is reaching pre-2012, uh, pre which was the 2011 export rates of Iranian oil to China. That's prior to the oil sanctions. So China is back at that level. And it's now looking at this horizon line of May 2nd. And will it reduce in time? How will the US count payments that are already prepaid but not delivered? How will it count floating storage? How will it count offshore things? So there's all these unknown unknowns, even about the sanction strategy, as well as the regional strategy. So there is still room in the max pressure belt to continue to ratchet up. And I'm just saying it doesn't only have to be economic. The pushback against the Guard Corps, if it's economic, is going to be destined to, to fail. Because the Guard Corps itself, even though it's a major economic entity, is not just an economic entity. It is active in the region. And its presence should be contested in Iraq, Syria, Lebanon. Again, I'm the first one saying the word land bridge here today. But if this is, this is our assessment of Iran's strategy in the region, then we should do something to counter that strategy. Part of it is cutting the air corridor. Part of it, part of it could be the funding. Uh, that Iran has to actually make sure these roads are paved. Part of it could actually be, what are the transit hubs? What are the companies providing it with, with men, with money, with munitions to actually deliver these things? Who, is, who, are, the, who are the people at the waypoints, right? So what, what is the pushback against Iran's strategy? And this is the thing for year two of max pressure that the administration needs to solve. It has the economic wins. Now is the time to translate them into political wins. So on that note, and going back to the tea leaves, Nader, if you can uh, tell us about an interesting op-ed that has come out by Mr. Musavian and who he is about uh, the suggestions that the U.S. or that Iran should negotiate with Trump and perhaps curb its activities in the region. Yeah, um, for those of you who do not know, uh, 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 Mr. Musavian is a former uh, ambassador of Iran to uh, uh, Germany. Germany. And he's now in Princeton. He's a, he's a resident scholar at Princeton University. And uh, uh, very much uh, uh, thought of as being a de facto ambassador of uh, Rouhani's uh, uh, government in, in, in the US. In Princeton. Uh, uh, well, yeah. Right. Uh, so uh, uh, interesting uh, um, op-ed today in, uh, in Mashreb, uh, the uh, Iranian news site, uh, very close to the IRGC. Uh, printed on the on the first top top part of the uh, uh, the uh, um, page uh, that Mr. Musavian basically argues that the time might have uh, come that we uh, sit down and negotiate uh, with Trump uh, about a new a new a new uh, a new agreement and the time and he goes further said the time might have come uh, that. Uh, 
we might want to have IRGC to limit is regional activities. Uh, these are uh, a couple of major demands that Washington has from Tehran. And, and if uh, Musabian's op-ed is any indication, it shows that uh, the FTO designation, uh, the uh, uh, zeroing, uh, going to zero out the uh, oil, uh, uh, the oil, uh, Iranian oil exports, uh, ex uh, 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 export, have major effect on the psyche of the Iranian government. And they, and I wouldn't be surprised that if they want to decide to back off from everything. Uh, Rouhani has said the same thing. He said today that if the United States apologizes and lifts all pressure, that they'll negotiate. So you, they're definitely getting very nervous about it. But get, again, the numbers, if you look at them, if they can't pay their people, including in the best season of the Revolutionary Guards, it's not going to look good for them. And the hash, they're not going to be able to save them. If they think foreign militias are going to be able to come to Tehran and keep them alive, I think they're mistaken, and they know it. So to me, this is not an aberration from Iran's strategy. This is just the next flashpoint, the next phase of it. Because Iran did come to the table in, in 2013. Yes, it got the concessions in Oman in 2012. But Iran did come to the table in 2013 and was able to reverse the dynamics of the sanctions and actually make the West look like the supplicant and not make Iran look like the supplicant. So I would assume their strategy here is going to be the same. You know, I have dropped a lot of religious and political whatever quotes today, I'll drop another one. If, if I had to sum up Khamenei's strategy right now, what is, the, what is the strategy? And I would say the Rouhani and the Musabian op-eds, pieces, quotes, whatever, are consistent with it. It is a Quranic injunction. And the Quranic injunction is, and I'll do the Arabic, inna la ma sabirin, which is very- so There are a lot of Arabs. <laughs> Part of my Persian accent. That was terrible. That was terrible accent. <laughs> Which is, verily God, <laughs> verily, God is with the patient. So this is consistent with the patient strategy. Raising your hand now and negotiating, running the clock on negotiations, whether overt or covert, uh, would be consistent with this patient strategy. And that's something Washington needs to keep in mind. Because if it wants genuine negotiations, it's going to have to look for the indicators in the Iranian economy that forced them to come to the table before and be aware of Iranian negotiating dynamics as a story of change over time. So you want to see consistent decline in GDP. You want to see failed attempts to curb inflation. You want to see oil well below 1 million on enforceability of that oil at zero after May 2nd. You want to see relative depreciation of the real to the US dollar consistently for three to six months. And then once you have the clear picture of those indicators, then it's safe to take the hand. But even then when it's safe to take the hand, we have to be cognizant of the goals here, which is on the Iranian people's side, does this mean that we forget about the grassroots side of the equation, that the Iranian people were an instrument in our pressure policy and that we had no use for them. That's what the regime is telling the people. I hope that's not what, what Washington's strategy is, because the Iranian people are, are no instruments. They're agents of their own future, and they should be supported. The second, of course, is, well, what would you, what would you settle for? You know, if the Iranian strategy is, how does this administration negotiate versus the last administration? And the track record is, with immense respect, of course, Helsinki, Hanoi, and on the previous negotiations, the P5 plus 1, you had a unified P5 plus 1, and here you have a divided P5 plus 1. The unified P5 plus 1 gave you the JCPOA. Who's to say Iran can't try to strike a bilateral deal and run the clock on these negotiations and get a worse off JCPOA and just have it all be rhetoric and no reality? So there's a lot to be careful from, even if Iran does put up its hand tomorrow and say negotiate. And a very important point that uh, uh, Ben makes is that the uh, the protests, the demonstrations uh, on the ground did not start with uh, li li us leaving J JCPOA. It started prior to that because of the economic uh, uh, stagnation, not because the uh, US has walked out of JCPOA, because of the uh, sa new sanctions, because of unfortunate uh, situation with the, uh, with the floods across Iran. Economy is in, uh, is in uh, uh, all of those indications is going there. there. Uh, the, uh, the, real is, is, uh, 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 the real is kept at 14,000 uh, two months uh, artificially. If they really let it go free, you're going to see a major, major fall in the, in the, in the two months uh, Black market uh, 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 free market. Uh, so you have all of those. So when this uh, uh, flood emergencies ends, 
I agree uh, uh, with Arizona and with Benham that these demonstrations are going to start, restart, new wave of demonstrations is going to start, and uh, it's, it's uh, really the White House needs to uh, uh, put their uh, mouth where their money is. That's their, that's, they have to come to find a way how to support uh, the, uh, the Iranian uprising against this regime, because that should be one of the main uh, 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 inputs uh, that they should consider when they when they when they want to do uh, a long term uh, long term strategy on Iran. Just making the, the economy collapse in by itself is not going to help. That should be coupled with uh, uh, supporting the uh, uh, the general uprising inside Iran. I have one last question before opening up. It's about uh, Foreign Minister Zarif's visit to New York, and in that visit today, he put um, a prisoner swap on the table. So we obviously know there's American prisoners in Iran. Um, he was specifically speaking about the British Iranian woman, Nazanin Zahari Ratcliffe, in exchange for an Iranian mother held in Australia. Um, what did, how do you take that? Well, I, I would tie that to everything else that we were hearing from Rouhani and from uh, others, that the regime is looking for an opening. They know that if the U.S. engages with it at all, it quiets these protesters. It disarms them. It takes the legs out from under the protest movement. Any overtures towards the U.S. that looks like we're, we are uh, capitulating or making some sort of concessions legitimizes the regime legitimizes it and undermines the protest. So they're, they're doing feelers. And these are the things that they didn't do with the Obama administration. Remember, Kerry said that, that exchanging prisoners was not on the table. This was only about the nuclear uh, profile with the JCPOA negotiations. That's why we had Americans that stayed in captivity after we went into the JCPOA, like Jason Rezion and others. Um, this, is, this is the regime's attempt to see if they can use the same tactics or, or new tactics uh, with the Trump administration that they didn't put in play with Obama or they, they think that the Trump administration might be open to. I just think they need cash. Well, they, they need cash and... They, they're demanding the UK pay them hundreds of millions of dollars and I have no doubt it's tied somehow into these hostages. The, the best thing about everything that's going on right now is that any aggressive action that the Islamic Republic takes loses them Europe loses European support for the JCPOA, anything. Remember, a year ago, opponents of walking away from the Iran deal said, this will uh, make the Islamic Republic rush towards a bomb. This will increase uh, regional uh, instability. This will make the IRGC uh, more brazen in what they're doing, and none of that happened. Every red line that we were warned about, Good point. we've called the IRGC's bluff. We've called the regime's bluff. Uh, they said any additional sanctions would be a reason for Iran to walk away from the JCPOA. The Islamic Republic of Iran needs the JCPOA more than we need it, more than any of our European allies need it. And with regards to the, the Chinese oil, so they, they basically purchase about 50 percent of, of I Iran's oil production. Uh, that would be about 500 million barrels a day out of the 1 million that Iran's producing now. China's been sinking money into the Iranian economy pre uh, before the U.S. left the JCPOA, China was sinking money into Iran because European countries were hesitant to enter the, the, the business, uh, uh, the economic sectors of Iran because of the threat of U.S. secondary sanctions. And that was with us in the JCPOA. That was with Secretary Kerry urging European allies to invest. So this is a, a much different scenario for, for the Islamic Republic. They are now in a position where they need cash where they're trying to get money, where they're putting pressure on our European allies, at the same time making these threats to shut down the Straits of Hormuz, attack Americans, do other things, knowing that they are becoming further and further isolated with every rhetorical statement. But if they actually took any action, they could lose Europe. They could lose what little friends they have now. And Russia and China are not going to be happy with the Islamic Republic having a nuclear weapon on their, on their border. The United States isn't going to let it happen. Israel's not going to let it happen. And the Russians are going to make sure, in the least, that Iran complies with the n Nuclear Proliferation Treaty, or the Non-Nuclear Proliferation Treaty. All right. Well, we're going to open it up for questions. Ooh, lots. Nick. I'm just bringing you a microphone. Thank you, Nick Kosar. Uh, 
I had a question because uh, during the flood season, we saw a lot of PR actions uh, led by General Jafari, and uh, he went to Aqala, he went to different parts of the country to save the people, but things got worse, and people blamed actually IRGC for many things that happened during the flash floods. The government said that we will resolve the problem by building dams, and the dams are going to be built by IRGC. Now that there's no money for IRGC and the government, what do you think the government and IRGC are going to do together? Uh, that's a very good question, if I may. Uh, the, uh, uh, along, with, uh, along with the designation of the FTO, the failure of IRGC to manage the uh, flooded area uh, I think was another major setback uh, for IRGC and for the regime. As a matter of fact, uh, in uh, places like Loristan and Khuzestan, which was the main uh, 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 floods now going on, uh, you, you, we've seen images of IRGC generals uh, being actually insulted, being almost attacked by the, by the angry mobs. That why they cannot, why they cannot uh, uh, bring uh, 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 what, what they promised. And Jafari had promised a lot of things. Uh, it, it was like his promise about what, he's going to, what he was going to do with FTO designation. And these are people are now uh, coming to believe that these are really empty promises. These are sloganeering. Uh, these are not really policy or really program to do anything about the floods. And, 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 and then there is a corruption element to it. Uh, a lot of these uh, uh, dams that are now in, in, in trouble, at least one of them, Karakhe, we know, was built by IRGC. Uh, in Shiraz, we had problems with uh, IRGC uh, developments uh, of the commercial and residential areas that caused the flood even becoming even worse uh, for, for the city. And so was in, in, in Golestan, with IRGC had to blow up the railroad that they had themselves yep. built uh, among, uh, a couple of years prior to that. So yes, those are really our are a major point that's bringing IRGC down. A footnote to that briefly is that the most important development with the Iranian response, government, IRGC, military, whatnot, is actually not the government, not the IRGC. It's, to me, the deployment of the Shia militias inside the country. Because if you remember, and I'm sure you and Ali Reza and everyone else remembers. The Iraqi militias? Exactly. Iraqi Hezbollah. And, and Lebanese Hezbollah. I thought they said they wanted him too. Fought him, Afghan, Fatim, 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 Fatim. Yeah. Everybody. All, all, the, all the, the, the command and control network, the whole umbrella, bring them in is that we, I never had empirical proof in 2009, but I had lots of friends in 2009 who would tell me that, you know, you heard Arabic on the streets, and there were lots of rumors that it was Lebanese Hezbollah helping the besiege do the quashing. Now I think the regime is signaling not only a lack of capability of its own national government to deal with these floods, it's signaling its willingness, capability, and intent to deploy foreign forces across Iran's territory to do something. Now, that's something tomorrow could change if what Nader is saying is that post-floods, we return to protests. That's something could be, well, the, whoever organized the flood relief in this area will do the protest uh, count pushback in this area. And that really is my big worry, is that when we talk about a Shiite liberation army, I know Nader's, you know used this term, everyone's used this term, Sh Shiite foreign forces, Shiite liberation army, this array of, this constellation of foreign actors that Iran has is to act abroad. What happens if they act at home? This is something that the Iranian people need to understand. I think it's, it's interesting uh, that Rouhani asked Khamenei if he could withdraw, I think, $2 billion from the National Development Fund, and Khamenei told him no. I think the last time they withdrew funds, uh, they spent them on the Revolutionary Guards. So it doesn't surprise me that they're going to build more dams uh, to enrich the guards, basically, while they ship the hashed into those areas. But I think fundamentally, Khamenei made a very big mistake in sending the Hash and Hezbollah into southwestern Iran because it proves that he has no legitimacy. Uh, if you can't rely on your own armed forces, if you can't rely on actual Iranians to enforce your rule, you have to bring in foreign forces. This, this means you're in deep trouble. And so he's basically, you know, Khamenei is like an emperor with a mercenary army surrounded by enemies. Soleimani also went to the flood areas as well. So you had Jafri and Soleimani, the two main faces of the IRGC and the Quds Force, go there to show that they are of the people, and then the people said, get out. They threw stones at them. Uh, it's right here in the front, I believe, in the middle. Thank you. 
Uh, Donna Tekhoui. Uh, my question is regarding IRGC being designated as an FTO, we had at the same time a country like Amman having joint military exercises with the IRGC and they even signed an MOU to boost military cooperation between those two countries. Um, what implications does this have for the Gulf or for countries like Amman? Is, and what is the U.S. perspective on that? Thank you. Uh, I'm sure the uh, uh, U.S. and Omani uh, 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 governments have been in contact uh, uh, before designation uh, of IRGC as FTO. Uh, and I think it would make it very difficult for Omanis to continue having that, uh, execute that M M MOU in, in, in future, uh, because that would be uh, really uh, crossing a red line on that basis. Uh, so I think that MOU is going to be a historical document that uh, nobody is going to really act on it at the time. I'm sure the two countries have been in very close consultation together. But, but I would just make sure you read that Reuters story from two days ago, which had all the carve-outs to the FTO in Oman and Iraq, where the two national governments explicitly included. So how long they could keep the inclusion, how you know, active the State Department lawyers were in creating the cutouts, uh, how, you know, is it just kind of like passive language? You know, what, what, what does the actual language say? Um, but the fact that Oman and Iraq were included, I think, is, is noteworthy as an exception. How long the administration may want to keep the exception is a political question, not a legal question. The Revolutionary Guard is smart. I mean, they're not only uh, signing MOUs, they're also getting Russia to be part of some of these MOUs as well when it comes with, to Baghdad and Syria. But they're also merging, they're trying to emerge, merge the electric grid in Iraq to Iran's. So they're smart about this. They know it's going to put pressure on the United States to use this tool effectively. I mean, what do you do? Do you punish Iraq for using Iranian electricity? Uh, I've said this many times. I'm okay with Iran acting like Canada because the Islamic Republic of Canada doesn't tell us who our president's going to be. And I'm not okay with Iran acting like Russia as it, as it acts towards the Ukraine or Pakistan, how it acts towards Afghanistan. So the Revolutionary Guard Corps is very smart. They know how to put the U.S. in a pickle, put us in a difficult position. This tool, though, changes everything if we use it effectively. Hello, uh, Abdul from Trucker Charters Organization. And um, as a person of uh, Lebanese heritage, um, I find it extremely troubling Hezbollah's um, involvement in uh, Iran and their sort of um, way of occupying southern Iranian land. Um, but this is just my view as a Lebanese person of Lebanese heritage. I want to know what's the sentiment on the ground in Iran, the academics like yourself or the, the regime, what do they feel about uh, Hezbollah's involvement in Iran? The, the people hate it because it's an occupying force, it's non-Iranian. There's a, a lot of resentment uh, toward proxies or surrogates like Hezbollah because uh, Iranians believe that the regime is spending their money on these groups, and they are. Um, one of the features of the demonstrations for the past 16, 17 months has been uh, slogans calling out the regime for spending money on Hezbollah and the Hashd al-Shabi and all these different groups while Iranians go without. Um, Khuzestan is relatively isolated. I think once, if the regime ever thinks about bringing uh, foreign forces like Hezbollah into the cities, they're going to get a huge reaction. Um, so that's why I think it was a big mistake on Khamenei's part, because it just shows he's weak more than anything. And I'm, I'm already seeing video images of the um, militias harassing women, trying to enforce the mandatory hijab and getting pushback, people yelling at them. So it's not gonna, it's not gonna work. Iranians are very uh, allergic to foreign occupation, and there's no way to describe this but as a foreign occupation. Salaam alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. My name is Hassan, I was born in Tehran, and I'm a Muslim. Now, I get two feelings. One is sadness and one is elation. Sadness is how uninformed each one of you are to sit in there and talk. You're welcome to come up and talk. No, he's not. <laughs> if, I, if, I, if I get a chance, I will do that. Are you, are, the, do you have a question or are you trying to be rude? Which one? My question is this. The revolution happened in Iran 40 years ago. 
ever since then we said their economy is bankrupt, they're going to go bankrupt, they're going to go bankrupt. 40 years they've been there, okay? Now, what I want to know is when America is going to understand that it's not business as usual anymore, anywhere in the whole world, and Iran is carrying the banner of that movement. So now you can answer my question. Which organization do you represent, by the way? We get a, uh, we'll do a question on this side. So I wanna, let's get one in the back, in the red. Good afternoon. Uh, my question is for Mike. Uh, sir, what is the difference between what you believe will happen versus what you personally hope for um, concerning the nature of U.S. Iranian relations over the course of the next hundred years. Thank you. Hundred years. Well, I would just answer real quickly, and then I'll throw it to my uh, my friends who are all from from Iran. That we we hope the Iranian people have a good relationship with the with the international community, with the West. This isn't a U.S. Iran relationship, but this is a U.S. Islamic Republic regime relationship. In that, we there are impediments to a healthy relationship in the region with the current status quo, and that's changing. So I, I'm not a hope guy. I, I'm, I hope, I'm happy to be wrong. I look at indicators and patterns, and the economy, the regime, the region is, is banking on continued US pressure on this regime. The Iranian people, from, from what I've heard from my colleagues and people I talk to, are hoping for a change. Uh, I simply want an effective U.S. foreign policy that, that doesn't stop on January 20th, 2021. I believe that this country should have a consistent foreign policy when it pertains to the Islamic Republic trying to get a nuclear weapon, increasing its ballistic missiles, its export of terrorism, the way it treats dissidents, the way it treats homosexuals, the way it treats women. Uh, I. I want a foreign policy in the United States, and this is what I do hope for, that is consistent regardless of who's president. Um, answering your question, sir, I welcome uh, opposing uh, views on whatever I say. I'm very sure my colleagues join me on that. I wish the regime you are defending was as generous about the opposition as we are. Uh, That's all right. Just want to make sure. Next question. No, 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 no. no. this guy off. Uh, lady in red. <laughs> uh, hi, uh, I'm from Iran and born and raised in Iran too. And I do believe Iran regime is the Middle East cancer. Uh, unfortunately, I lived there for a long time of my life. My old teenager life been passing this under this regime's authority. I have a question uh, for Ali Reza. He said there is difference between IRGC and regular army, Artish. Uh, my question is, I know uh, what I know about the Iranian uh, history. Uh, Khomeini, when he's coming, he came in power, he decided to resolve this Artish, this regular army. Then he changed his mind. Why he changed his mind to uh, dissolve this army? As I know, as an answer for myself, I want to hear if you answer too, actually. Uh, when uh, Khomeini he declared jihad, holy war against Kurd in uh, in north uh, west of Iran, Artesh did same thing that IRGC did in Middle East. So we calling Artesh or regular army inside of Iran terrorist group inside of Iran. So what we talking about the IRGC is the terrorist group outside of Iran. So for us as an ethnic group in Iran, there is no difference between regular army or IRGC. And my second comment, and uh, kind of comment actually, not question, for future of Iran, I'm surprised that most of the Iranian opposition that we calling Persian opposition more than Iranian opposition because they are focusing on nationalism, not patriotic. Because it is different between patriotic and nationalism. They care about the keep Iran as a united country and they're talking about the secular regime for future of Iran. But we as an ethnic group, we know uh, we have uh, almost 50% of Iranian are Persian, but the rest of them, they are Kurds, Arab, Baluch, and Turks. So we as a different ethnic group, we're talking about the federalism system in future in Iran, not just secular regime. 
secular system. But my question is why most of the opposition that I'm calling Persian opposition, we have a great uh, opposition in America, they always talking about the different religious and women right, religious right. They never talk about the ethnic group right in America or in the West media. So it is kind of the criticizing this group and I hope that this group will be more democrat and more using this freedom in America for different ethnic group in Iran too. Thank you. So I'll start with your last question first. I think it's a great question. I think a lot of people I know who are in the opposition believe Iran is a nation of nations that you know, all Iranians are entitled to the country and full freedoms. That's the way I think. Um, now, does everybody think like that? No, but I think a lot of Iranians that have grown up in America have basically absorbed a lot of the values of America in terms of believing in liberal democracy. And in terms of federalism, because let's be honest, Iran is a Middle Eastern country and is prone to all sorts of instabilities and divisions. I think whatever uh, Iran will be like in the future, there has to be some sort of figure or institution that represents all Iranians and can really unite Iranians under one umbrella. I, I don't think ultimately the system of government matters as much, whether it's a republic or a constitutional monarchy, but as the characteristics of the system. That it's an open society that defends individuals' rights regardless of uh, gender, ethnicity, religion, sexual orientation. Those are more important. I think the opposition has traditionally had these false arguments as to whether Iran should be a republic or a constitutional monarchy. But what matters is how the country is governed and what the leadership of the country thinks of its people. Uh, that when you have the Islamic Republic that thinks of all Iranians as being expendable, no one is going to have equality, whether they're Arab or Baluchi or Lor or Iranian. Uh, a lot of Iranians who are Shia uh, or are Persian are discriminating against as well. So I think it's important to think of a future Iran in terms of protecting its citizens' rights and thinking of its citizens as citizens and not expendable objects like the Islamic Republic has. In terms of the Aktash, you know, I think ultimately the Islamic Republic needed the armed forces. It was fighting a war with Iraq. Um, they were well equipped at that time. Uh, it couldn't fully trust them, so it created uh, a parallel force. But ultimately, Iran's rulers can't even trust each other or even the Revolutionary Guards. So it makes sense for there to be an Aktash, however weak it is to balance the Revolutionary Guards. And if you look at Iran, there are multiple security agencies, all run by Khamenei's office. Um, and he has the most powerful security and investigative forces under his personal command. But he will never trust the full spectrum of the security forces. Even the guards, I bet she has a lot of distrust uh, for the guards. And there's this rumor that the chief of the protection unit had uh, um, fled the country and he was seeking asylum. And although that specific story might not be true, I wouldn't be surprised that there's a lot of dissent uh, within the guards and the Aktash and even the Basij uh, against the regime. And it'll come to a head at some point. Um, and nobody believes in Khamenei's banner anymore. I think there are a few people in the West do, but Iranians don't believe in that sort of uh, uh, rhetoric and sloganeering. I think we have time for one last one right here. Let's see if I've got one. You might be able to go, yeah. Let's see if we can squeeze you in. <laughs> Hi, my name is uh, Salah Bayazidi. I am representative of Komala Party in Washington, D.C. I think this designating IRGC is a uh, right step direction, but it's too late because they are responsible for four decades terrorism inside against their people and abroad. They are responsible directly for hostaging U.S. diplomats in 1979 as day after revolution, responsible for killing, mass killing of U.S. Marines in Lebanon 1983. And just recently, Mr. Pompeo confirmed they are responsible for killing U.S. personnel, 603 of them. I, I believe his number is so high, higher than. But my question is, while we, the previous nuclear deal also was locked off, the, we, they all talk about uh, bringing Iran to a table to better deal, but never talk about the human rights violation. What's, what's the reason? I know it's maybe we have weakening of the Iranian opposition. Uh, so how we can uh, include that uh, question in a while? You, you know, weakening Iran, bringing, dragging Iran to negotiation, you know, then again, 
make a fat the regime, you know, against its people. So when we can see this negotiation finally, you know, uh, be included human rights violation in Iran, so definitely Iran will be benefit of that. Thank you. Can I give 30 seconds and I'll kick it to you real quick? So, S Senator uh, um, Manchin and Senator uh, Cardin both voted against the Iran deal because of the Magnitsky Act violations, because of the human rights violations, because of Annex 2. And we were able to show both senators that, that the, by taking sanctions off the besiege in the IRGC would actually empower them to go back and start punishing the people. And so that's something that we were able to use the Magnitsky Act to get uh, Senator Cardin and Manchin to vote against the Iran deal. Uh, you are pointing to an extremely important point. Uh, the, uh, one of the biggest uh, mistakes uh, the administration of Obama did uh, was the coming to terms with Tehran on nuclear deal. Aside from if this was a good deal or not, I'm not talking about the nature of that deal, but just coming to, to a deal with Tehran uh, they, their uh, enthusiasm uh, of the administration, their determination to come to a deal was so much that took oxygen out of the room from every other issues, including the human rights and including the rights of minority and national minorities in Iran. Uh, this is uh, what this administration should not follow. Uh, we have a president who is uh, 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 said uh, to, uh, is a transactional president. Okay, part of the transaction should be the human rights and the rights of the minorities in Iran. And without that, uh, and without uh, actually having a very close relationship with the opposition groups like <laughs> yours, uh, uh, this administration is going to fail if they want to just, uh, just come to a terms on another uh, uh, JC Part 2, which would include everything except human rights and except the uh, uh, recognition of opposition in Iraq. The last administration didn't want to talk about human rights because it claimed that would undermine human rights activists in Iran, and there's really no evidence for that. I think this was one of the biggest U.S. failures in terms of this Iran policy. When in 2009, Iranians turned onto the streets and President Obama didn't say anything. Uh, that was a major undermining of the democratic movement in Iran. And I think this time around, uh, this administration is not going to remain quiet. Uh, if you look, it has actually emphasized human rights issues much, much more uh, than any previous administration um, we can think of. Regardless of what you think about this administration, it has done, it has done that. It's talked about religious liberty, about ethnic issues about treatment of women. There's been much more focus on it. And I think maybe human rights, unfortunately, will not be at the top of the list uh, when it comes to determining the future of U.S.-Iran relations, but it should be. And I think if we push hard enough, there will be a place for it. OK, one last one right here. I don't know if we'll have time to get the project. She's bringing you the mic. <laughs> Hi, Bo Wilcox from the Middle East Institute, program intern. Um, so my question lies in the pressure uh, the U.S. is applying towards Iran. First off, how, do, how does this classification of the Iranian Revolutionary Guard build upon the pressure that was already applied to the sanctions? Within a sense, uh, Michael, I know you pointed out earlier that European companies might be more hesitant to, uh, within the public eye, that might look bad to deal with a state that uh, has a terrorist organization. But on top of that, how can the US react to these companies, European, Chinese, etc.? And then secondly, from the sanctions, the Europeans uh, responded with the SPV. How that's doing right now, you know, it's in the works. But going in on top of that, how can we possibly see China, Russia, or even the Europeans continue efforts to undermine the US pressure? Thank you. So, so real quick, and then I'll kick it to my, my colleagues. So they were hesitant before the designation. They were hesitant when we were still in the JCPOA, they being Europe, they being European companies. While the governments were urging their private sector to invest in Iran, the private sector was saying, no, we're not going to put our assets at risk uh, for U.S. secondary sanctions. Uh, these, these bypass mechanisms that you're talking about become di more difficult now. So the, the FTO designation, again, prior to the FTO designation, uh, supporters of, of, of the regime, when I say supporters of the regime, supporters of policies favoring the regime, always said that an FTO designation was required. 
So the FTO designation makes the oil, ending the oil waivers make more sense now. It makes hitting the, the, the IRGC Navy make more sense now, now that it's an FTO. Everything that you need to do to get people on board becomes easier with an FTO designation. Because prior to the FTO designation, that was the argument. Well, they're only an SDGT, a specially designated global terrorist group. FTO is the top tier. You can't get any higher than FTO. And that's where they are now. And it changes everything if we use the tool effectively. Just briefly on the financial sanction side, you know, they both have asset freezes. The FTO has a visa ban. But on top of that, there's the material support clause. So whereas with the Treasury Department and all the previous sanctions you mentioned, there has to be some nexus with the U.S. government, either transacting in U.S. dollars involving U.S. persons or going through the U.S. system at some point. The material support one is broad and applies to foreign persons. Now, secondary sanctions on Treasury did apply to foreign persons, but this can help make that stick. And now to the point about the SPV, yeah, even though so far the European one is failing, the reason I still worry about it, you know, in working with FED, we work heavily on financial sanctions issues, is because you don't want the Europeans to get a taste for this flavor and then ultimately deploy what they've learned from the one, two, three times they failed creating a bypass bartering mechanism clearing system here uh, with a country that is a larger sanctions target on which they don't agree on the predicate for you. So it's easy in terms of markets when you ask, it's either the US or the Islamic Republic of Iran. But then you go back to that same target you know, 20 years later and you say it's the Russian Federation and it's Russian gas or it's the US. That target state may not make the same, may not make the same calculation. And if they've refined this alternative payment system as the multi-generational move away from the dollar continues, then your peaceful tool of coercion loses its value. So that's why it's crucial to kill the SPV in the cradle and make sure that there isn't some kind of second, third order learning thing here. Because the longer it goes on and the more they try to experiment with it, even if they fail on their own accord, they're still learning. And again, you know, this is, a, this is a sanctions issue. This is not an Iran foreign policy issue. It's a functional issue. And the FTO already has effect on, even on Iranian friends. Uh, for example, the Iraqi government might want to continue relationship with Iran economically, but uh, chairman of uh, individual Iraqi major banks do not want to do it anymore because a chairman of an of a Iraqi bank do not want to get into a list of cooperating with a, co uh, with, with a company which is owned by the IRGC which is, or, or, or controlled by IRGC, which is now designated as a terrorist organization. So it will have not only effect on Europeans, on our friends and our allies, but even on the, on the, on the governments that are semi-friendly with Iran. That was the Monday Reuters story. Oh, oh. I don't know, but it, the predicate was Monday. Is it different than Oman, Iraq, NGOs, and several foreign firms? Is the State Department? European businesses? Where is it? OK. <laughs> I don't think so. We have to read exactly what it is. It could be very specific. Uh, uh, transactions that are being exempted. And it probably, not general. Probably I don't think it's a general exemption. Probably it's not a general license. It's a very specific question. Probably expanding the FTO exemptions, which were the same ones that they expended on Monday. Right. Yeah. Exactly. exactly. Okay. So on that note, I think... Uh, oh. You get time for one more? Or not? All right, one more. <laughs> The United States' stated goal is to uh, change the regime, and some of you talked about what they might seek in the negotiating table. Uh, does anyone in the United States government actually believe this regime can change? Um, personally, I don't think it's possible because I think any change of this regime would destroy this regime, and I think it, it just can't survive uh, by changing. It's, it's part of its, its uh, mission is to spread the revolution. Um, so, do, do, does the United States government actually believe its stated goal, or is there something else going on behind the scenes? And should the United States be helping opposition groups? Yes, it should be very actively helping opposition groups. I'll give you a perfect example that I think shows this regime will never change. They are supposed to meet uh, standards set by the Financial Action Task Force, FATF fund money laundering and terrorism financing. Otherwise, it would sink their economy. It has a major impact on their ability to trade, 
uh, with the Europeans and Asians. And they wrote a law but exempted financing of Hezbollah and Hamas to terrorist groups. So they can't even act in their own, well, they do act in their own interest. They can't act in the interests of, A, the Iranian people or the international community because they refuse to even sign a law that would help the Iranian economy. To me, that shows that this regime is never, ever going to change. The way the United States wants it to change, uh, in a way that's good for US national security and for the security of the Middle East. It'll never happen. I have to meet one senior US official right now who believes that. I can't speak for them. Uh, there's an official US policy. You know, and sometimes things don't work according to official policy. I think with the current course, the chances of collapse are increasing, of regime collapse, whether it'll happen or not, we can't predict. But the factors are not looking good for the Islamic Republic. Yeah. Halas. Halas. Mm -hmm. Halas. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Thank our panelists for our lively discussion. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.